Father in heaven, tonight as we open your word and we look at this subject, we pray in a special way for the Holy Spirit that it may be present, that it will give us the insight, the knowledge, the understanding that we each may purpose in our hearts to stand on your side, to follow you, to walk with you, to let you be our God, and that we will say, we're your people, you be our God, and we will walk and follow you by faith. Grant to us that opportunity and that privilege, we pray in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> I can think over the years of all the different things that I've heard people say the mark of the beast was. Uh, I can remember when they said that somebody's going to come around with a branding iron and is going to brand on your forehead 666, and everybody's going to receive the mark of the beast. And they people believed that that's the way it was going to happen. And then as time went on, people said, when they came out with Social Security numbers, they said, don't take one of those things. If you take a Social Security number, you're going to get the mark of the beast without question. You're going to have it. And then I can remember, and I was just a kid, at the time of the Second World War, and they came out with rationing stamps, and they said, don't take them. If you take those rationing stamps, you're going to get the mark of the beast. That's just for sure. You'll get it. But they didn't. And then, just here in the last few years, they've talked about a computer chip, saying, oh, somebody's going to come around and they're going to put in your forehead a computer chip, and that'll be the mark of the beast. So you hear all kinds of things about the mark of the beast and what it is and so forth. We need to understand what the mark of the beast is. It's very, very important that we understand where we stand. You see, the Scripture divides things into twos, not threes. It divides things into twos. It talks about the saved and the lost, the sheep and the goats, the righteous and the unrighteous. It divides it into twos. When it comes to the mark of the beast, only two. Those that have the mark of the beast, those that don't. Watch what the Scripture says about it. Then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. These are the people that receive the mark of the beast. Contrasting, those people, you read in Revelation 15, and it says, And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have victory over the, over the beast, over his image, and over the mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Here are the people that don't have the mark of the beast. So you have two classes, those that have the mark of the beast, those that do not have the mark of the beast. And you and I... I don't care where you are, anywhere in the world, you have to make a decision whether you're going to be on God's side or whether you're going to be on the beast's side because it's only two classes, that's all there is. And so tonight, we want to clearly identify who the beast is. Now, the beast that's referred to here is the beast mentioned in Revelation, the 13th chapter. But we found out in our study Last night, last presentation, we found out that the beast of Revelation 13 is also the one that's pictured in Revelation 17, okay? Because he's the one that was, is not, yet is. Okay, so let's take a look at what the Scripture says about this beast here in Revelation 13, and I have highlighted different parts in these texts to help you identify who it is. Then I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rising up out of the sea, 
having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. One point you need to listen to carefully. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and what? Followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast, and they worshiped the beast saying, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Now, you notice God's given you one point right after another to help you identify who this beast is. Then he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, those who dwell in heaven. And it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. Authority was given him over tribe, tongues, and nations. All who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So here it's listed one point right after another. And then it comes and says, here is what? Wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For it is the number of a man. His number is 666. So now we have just looked at seven points that God gives to identify this beast. And I must say that we're going to look at these seven points quickly. I do not have time, folks, to go back and go through each one of those points and spend a little time on it. If you want to study it more, then go and get the one on uh, Five of Fallen and look under Papal Rome and it'll help you there. But I'll have to go through these quickly because there's probably people watching who didn't see any of those and they need to understand who the beast is. So let's see if we can take the seven points of identification and talk about who they are and find out what the scripture says about it. Okay, the first point of identification is simply this. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his authority. The dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority. Second one, that he would rule for 42 months. So we're finding out how long he's going to be ruling. Would be a persecuting power. Would speak blasphemies. Would receive a deadly wound. The deadly wound would be healed. And all the world would wander after the beast. And his number is... Six, six, six. Those seven points the Scripture gives. Now, folks, there is only one power in all the history of mankind and all the earth that fits all those points of identification. Uh, you can't find another power other than the papal power that will fit all those points of identification. So the Scripture makes it absolutely clear who the beast is. Now, you can take probably four of them and make them fit some other power, but you can't take all seven of them and make them fit some other power. It'll only fit this power. So let's take a look at those seven points and uh, see what the Scripture has to say about it for us. One, the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. The dragon referred to here, this is the beast of Revelation 13, the dragon that's referred to here is the 12th chapter. The dragon in the 12th chapter of Revelation gave to this beast in Revelation 13 its power, its seat, and its authority. And if you pick up your Bible and you go back and you study it, you'll find that the dragon mentioned here in Revelation 12 is pagan Rome. So it's saying that pagan Rome would give to this beast its power, its seat, and its authority. And history tells us that's exactly what happened. Watch. To the succession of the Caesars came the succession of the pontiffs in Rome. When Constantine left Rome, he gave his seat to the 
Pontiff in history says that the Bishop of Rome stepped to the seat of Caesar and seized the scepter. And so we find exactly the dragon, pagan Rome, gave to papal Rome its power, its seat, and its authority. Second point. It says, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. This was the period of time that this beast power would continue would be 42 months. And as we looked at this in the Scripture and have studied it, we found out that in the Bible, a day represents one year in Bible prophecy. He said, I have laid on you a day for each year, Ezekiel 4, verse 6. So if I've got 42 months and I multiply, because there's 30 days in the biblical month, and I multiply it times 42, it gives me 1,260 years or days. That was the time that they would rule for 1,260 years. And history tells us that's exactly what happened. That is known in history, folks, as the years of papal supremacy. That's when they were in charge. Okay, and then it says, and it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So this power is going to make war with the saints. Persecution, that's what it's basically saying. This is what it says here, the death penalty for heresy by Coulter, and it says, morally, they believe themselves to be saving thousands of souls by the burning of a single heretic. Politically, they believed, if possible, by sufficiently persistent, ruthless persecution to extinguish heresy altogether. Now, stop and think about it. I told you, never in history has there ever been a time in which a church power took over civil power, state power, that it didn't persecute. Because really a church, a church really isn't worth its salt, folks, if it doesn't believe that it's teaching truth. Now you stop and think about it. A church is not worth anything if it doesn't believe that what it's teaching is truth. So that church believes they're teaching the truth Therefore, if they can get everybody to accept what they believe, they believe they're giving them the truth. And so, without question, churches that get involved in civil power persecute. That's what happens. That's what takes place. And, of course, the papal power believed that, and they persecuted. And I mentioned to you, all you have to do is, you know, pick up such books as Fox Book of Martyrs. Or uh, read Here I Stand by Bainton, History of the Reformation by D'Aubigny. All those books outline for you what took place, and you can read about the persecution that happened by this power. Okay, let's go on. And he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. So it says that he would speak great things and blasphemies. I don't have time to go back and give you all the basis. You understand what blasphemy is? Do you understand what the Scripture uh, it says blasphemy is? The Scripture says that blasphemy is when a person puts, considers himself God. When a person, like they accused Jesus of blasphemy because he said he was God. That's one definition Scripture gives. The other definition that Scripture gives is when a human being claims he has the right to forgive sins. They also classified that as blasphemy. And so it says this power would speak great words blasphemy. Well, I'm just going to read you one statement. There's many, many, many statements I could read you. Great encyclical letter of Pope Leo XIII, and this is what he said. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. We hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. And this is basically what they believe. So as far as Scripture is concerned, that's blasphemy. And I saw one of his heads as, it had been, as if it had been mortally wounded. Now this beast has seven heads, and he said, I looked at one of those heads, and it was mortally wounded 
wounded. And in our study, you remember, we found out that at this particular time, Napoleon has come to power. Napoleon, very desirous of being able to rule all of Europe. In fact, he said Europe was soon to become one nation. He was going to put it all together. But he realized he could not do that unless he could break the back of the papal power because the papal power was in control. And so we find on February the 15th, 1798, he, Berthier, made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government, and established a secular one. The papal power came into being 538 A.D. That is when the bishop of Rome took over the seat, 538 A.D., it said he was going to rule for 1,260 years, which takes you to 1798, and just exactly as the Scripture said, Napoleon was there, took over, and established a secular government, 1,260 years. And his deadly wound was healed. All the world marveled and followed the beast. When Napoleon took over. They took the pope, put him in prison. He died in prison. They elected another pope. He moved back to the Vatican, moved in, and didn't show his face for 50 years. But there was effort after effort made to try to settle this thing, and this in history is called the Roman question. And it was always a question of settlement. And they always tried to settle it by the Italian parliament. Uh, Rome was never willing to accept that. And that went back and forth, back and forth for over a hundred years until finally you hit the 1900s. And then a man now is in charge in Italy who is not controlled by the parliament. He is a dictator. And his name is Mussolini. And Mussolini decided he would settle the Roman question. They set up conferences, and after negotiation, it was settled. And history tells us this is what happened. This is the San Francisco Chronicle, 1929. And it says the Roman question tonight was a thing of the past. And the Vatican was at peace with Italy. In affixing the autographs to the memorable document, healing the wound, doing what? Healing the womb, extreme cordiality was displayed on both sides, and thus the Lateran Pact was signed, 1929. Do you understand what it did? Hmm? Do you understand what the Lateran Pact did? Well, it gave back to the Vatican the right to be a civil government. So it's not, when we refer to this, it's not just a church. It is a church as well as a government. Let me give you a quick illustration of what I'm talking about. Why did the Pope have the right to speak to the United Nations? Because the United Nations, the only one that's allowed to speak there, is a head of state. But you see, he is head of state. And therefore, he had the right to speak at the United Nations. There's one other religious leader that spoke at the United Nations. Do you know who that is? The Dalai Lama, because he's the head of a state. So you see, this is, this is what it gave back to him. It paid him $21 million for the spoilation of the papal states. It gave him the right to be a civil power, reestablish that. It gave him the right to send ambassadors to every country in the world and to receive ambassadors. All that was given to them at the signing of the Lateran Pact. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Now, let me just pause here. You have to read this carefully. It says that it is the number of a man. The Bible also says this, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the what? Number of his 
name. So it tells us it's the number of a man. It tells us it's the number of his name. So that gives us indication of what it's talking about. Now when we're looking at this, you have to realize that this is symbolic. We don't have beasts running around here with seven heads. See? So you find that the beasts are symbolic. When it talks about an image, that's symbolic. When it talks about a name, it's going to be symbolic. When it talks about a number 666, that's a symbol, symbolic. The seal is, the mark is, all that symbolic language, okay? The official name, the official name for the Pope is Vicarious Philae Dei. That's an official name for him. Okay. It says it's the number of a man, it's the number of his name. So if we take his name, Vicarious Philae Dei, and when you went to school, you were taught something. You were taught Roman numerals. Why? Do you use them? No. But God intended for you to understand this. That's the reason you're taught Roman numerals. See? So watch. Because you remember, Roman numerals are nothing but Latin letters that have numerical value. That's what they are. So if we take the word vicarious, watch what happens. V is worth how much? Five. I is worth one. C is worth a hundred. A has no numerical value, neither does R. I is a value of one. U carries the same value as V. U is a modern letter. Years ago, there was no U. It was V. And if you doubt what I'm saying to you, I'm going to show you something. This is a little town in Oklahoma called Okmulgee. Okay? I'm going to show you the courthouse in Okmulgee. Look at it. Can you read it up there? Okmulgee. Look at how the U is. V. County. Look how they spell county. Court. See how they spell it? Look how they spell house. All of them have a V instead of a U. Because that is, U is a modern term. So when it says there, a vicarious ville dei, that U has the same numerical value as does the V. Phile, F has no numerical value. I has the value of 1. L has the value of 50. Both I's, 1 each. That gives you 53. And day E. Day is worth 500. I is worth 1. 501. You add them up. That is 666. Six, six. So when the scripture says it is the number of a man, it's the number of his name, and that is his official name, this God gives you and I to help us understand and identify who the beast is. Okay? And that's what we have just done. We have identified who this beast is. Okay. So now, let's move ahead and see if we can find out what is the mark of the beast. What is the mark of the beast? Well, to begin with, let's get something clear. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. It says the mark of the beast can be received in the right hand or it can be received in the forehead. Okay. Why does the scripture say it can be received in the right hand and it can be received in the forehead? Because in the scripture, the right hand represents cooperation. That's what it stands for. So it says that he gives his hand to it. It means I'm willing to cooperate. For forehead represents intelligence. It represents where I give mental acceptance to something. Let me tell you, friend, they're not going to come around and hold you down and put in your forehead a computer chip. That's not going to happen. Okay? Understand that. Let me ask you something. I serve the Lord. I love the Lord. I'm going to stand with him. So let's say somebody comes around and they hold me down and they install a computer chip in my forehead. Is that going to change my relationship with the Lord? Not in the least. So let's not be led astray by that kind of thinking. 
That, when it says that it is given in the forehead, that means that I give mental acceptance to that. I believe that. That's what I say. That's what I believe. If I may not give mental acceptance to it, but I say I'll go along, that's giving my right hand to it. That is what it means when it talks about being in the right hand or in the forehead. Okay. I'm going to read to you three texts. I'm going to read to you Revelation 14, 9, 10, and 11. When I'm through reading that, I'm going to ask you a question. If you answer the question right, we'll go on. If you don't answer it right, we're going to go back and read those texts again because it's important that you know exactly what it says. So let's look and see what it says. Then a third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment of sins forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now, let me ask you, is this talking about the people that receive the mark of the beast? You're quiet. You, you've got to respond better than that, so let's back it up and take a look. We'll just back it up here and see what it says. Okay, verse 9. Here we go. Then a third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image, receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand. Is that talking about people that receive the mark of the beast? Yes. yes. Okay. He himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength in the cup of his indignation. Is that talking about people that receive the mark of the beast? Yes. yes. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of lamb. Is that talking about people that see the mark of the beast? Yes. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night. Who worships the beast and his image, whoever receives the mark of his name. Is that talking about people that receive the mark of the beast? Yes. All three of those verses are talking about people that receive the mark of the beast. Okay, let's read verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Do these people receive the mark of the beast? No, no they don't. Why don't they? they? Why don't these people receive the mark of the beast? Because they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. You with me? Because they keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Therefore, therefore, if I keep God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus, I don't receive the mark of the beast. Right? Therefore, therefore, the mark of the beast must affect the commandments of God and faith in Jesus Christ. Are you with me? See? It has to. It has to affect the commandments of God and faith in Jesus Christ. So the question then is, of these two things, affects two things, faith in Jesus Christ, commandments of God. What does the Scripture tell us about faith in Jesus Christ. Well, this is what it says. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So the Scripture's telling me that the way I walk with the Lord is by faith. Okay. That's how I walk with Him. And be found in Him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So it simply tells me that my life is changed and the righteousness of Christ is given to me by faith. That's how I walk as a Christian. 
Does the papal power have anything to say about this question of walking with the Lord by faith? Well, let's look. There is only one holy and Catholic and apostolic church outside of which there is no salvation for every creature to be subject to the Roman pontiff. It says the only way you can be saved is by being part of the Catholic Church. Not by faith, not by justification by faith, but by belonging to the church. Let me read you one more. If anyone shall say that by faith alone the sinner is justified so as to understand that nothing else is required to cooperate in the attainment of the grace of justification, and that it is in no way necessary that he be prepared and disposed by the action of his own will, let him be anathema. In other words, they're saying that it isn't by justification by faith, but it's by you and I working our way into the kingdom of heaven. All right. Also, what about keeping God's commandments? Does God have anything to say about keeping his commandments? If you love me, keep my commandments. Very clear, very simple. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Well, has the papal power done anything that affects the commandments of God? Well, if you pick up your Bible and read Exodus 20th chapter, you'll find the Ten Commandments. If you pick up a Douay version of the Bible or an American Catholic version of the Bible and turn to Exodus 20 and read the commandments, they'll read just like yours. But when you pick up a catechism, the picture changes. You see, the second commandment has been taken out. And the third commandment has been pushed up to the second and the fourth commandment up to the third and so forth. And they divide the tenth one so they can still have ten. But they do something. Listen to this. This comes from the Catholic Encyclopedia, volume four. The church, after changing the day of rest from the Jewish Sabbath to the seventh day of the week, to the first, made the third commandment. You see, they've moved it up. They made the third commandment refer to Sunday as a day to be kept holy as the Lord's day. So they took the second one out. They moved it up. The fourth commandment became the third. And they said that really applies not to the Sabbath, but to Sunday. Uh, I read this next statement a few years ago. I couldn't believe it when I read it. And so I picked up the phone and I called the priest that wrote this statement and talked to him personally. I want you to listen to the statement. Perhaps the boldest thing, the most revolutionary change the church ever did happened in the first century. The holy day, the Sabbath, was changed from Saturday to Sunday. Now, he's, he's saying this is one of the most revolutionary things that's ever been done. And they changed the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday. Now, listen to what he goes on and says. Not from any direction noted in the Scripture. He said there's, there's nothing in the Scripture here saying they could do this, okay? But from the church's sense of its own power. Said, church did it. Of their own power. People who think the Scripture should be their sole authority should logically become Seventh-day Adventists and keep the Sabbath holy, Saturday holy. He said, if you're going to follow Scripture, if you're going to say, this is my authority, this is what I believe, he said, then you've got to come back to keeping the Sabbath. What are you saying? Definitely made a change. Catholic record. Sunday is our mark of authority. 
Listen to this. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is proof of that fact. And so you find a change was definitely made. Okay, let's hurry. We've got quite a little bit yet to go. And he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause. As many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This is saying what this beast power is going to do. And he caused all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Says that this was going to cause the people, he's going to enforce it. And that no one may be able to buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So it says that in order for this to happen, it has to be enforced by government. That's what it says. When it says that he will speak and cause, that means legislation and enforcement. And so at this present time, nobody has the mark of the beast. It is not being enforced on people. But when the day comes that it is enforced, and you and I willingly accept it, or accept it, period, then we are receiving the mark of the beast. That's what it's saying. So how are they going to put teeth into this? How are they going to make it happen? This is what they're saying, so listen carefully. The civil authority should be urged. The who should? Civil authority should be urged to cooperate with the church in maintaining and strengthening this public worship of God and to support with their own authority the regulations set down by the church pastors. For it is only in this way that the faithful will understand why it is Sunday and not the Sabbath day that we keep holy. They say, in other words, it needs to be enforced. It needs to be a requirement. We need to close up things on Sunday. Listen to one more. In respecting religious liberty and the common good of all, Christians should seek recognition of Sundays and the church's holy days as legal holidays. Now listen to what they're saying here. It is time that we demonstrate our Catholic vitality and engage in the public policy debate. We have the power and the people to embark on this movement and the movement that will benefit all Americans. Now, you live in a democracy, right? Yeah. And in a democracy, who rules? Majority. Okay, so you can think that through right quick. And that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So how are they going to enforce that? Well, very simple. As long as people have money, you cannot boycott them. Did you know that? Because if you can't get it at the front of the store, you can get it at the back. But you live in a different time, folks. We live in a time of the Internet. And you can't use cash on the Internet. You have to use what is called cyber money. You use your card. And you can take that card and you can trade and buy stuff anywhere in the world. Did you realize that? But all they've got to do is say, don't accept that number. And dear friend, you have been boycotted. See, this is how it happens. The believers of the last days, what are they going to believe? Here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. They'll worship the Lord. I'm talking about you can sign what the believers will do. They'll worship the Lord. There'll be a small remnant. There's not going to be a large group of people, folks. The world as a whole is not going to come running and join the Lord's side. That's not going to happen. Three, they'll believe that salvation is by Jesus alone. No other way. Justification by faith in Jesus Christ. They'll keep God's commandments. They'll have the faith of Jesus. They'll say, this is what we believe. Stand on Jesus Christ. 
I have God's seal in their forehead. And by the way, the seal of God's placed in the forehead. It's not placed in the hand. So when they get the seal of God, that means that person gives mental acceptance to what God says. I say, I'm going to follow what God's word says. I'm going to obey his word. And they'll uphold God's Sabbath. That's what the believers in the last days, the days in which you and I are living, are going to do just before Jesus comes. You and I must place ourselves on the Lord's side. We need to take the same stand, folk, that the apostles of old took. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. That's where we need to stand. We need to say, I'm standing with the Lord, put myself on His side, I'm going to follow Him. I hope that you have learned, I hope that you have been helped with this series on Bible prophecy. Folks, stand with God in all that you do. A coal miner of old would leave his family every day and descend into the depths of the earth with the certain knowledge 